This is the seventh lecture for MA 1012. In this lecture, we'll think about power series. We can think of a power series as something like an infinite polynomial. Consider as an example 1 plus z plus z squared plus z cubed plus dot 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 going on forever, which we can write in our notation as the sum n equals 0 to infinity z to the n. One thing to note is that we're allowing the possibility n equals 0. We could start the sum anywhere and we go on from there in a power series. Uh, the point is that these are powers of the variable z. Um, now the coefficients don't always have to be just ones. We could have more complicated power series. We could have something like 1 plus uh, 3z plus uh, 7z squared plus dot 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 dot. Some uh, complicated choices of coefficients maybe at each step. Um, Another possibility is we could expand the thing around some other point instead of being around z equals zero. We can think of it as expanded around a different point. Um, consider something like uh, z minus four plus uh, z minus four squared plus z minus four cubed plus dot dot dot. We think of that as being expanded around z equals four. So, um, so this is around around um, z equals 0 because the terms are in z's. Here or they're in z minus 4's and so we think of them as being, this is being expanded around z equals 4. What do I mean by around? Well, the idea is that we should be able to make the terms get very, very small. If z is very close to 4, then very high powers of z minus 4 should get to be very, very small very quickly. And so we'd expect that after only taking a few terms into account, we've already got a pretty good approximation to what the function actually looks like. That's not a rigorous uh, statement, but it is often the case. So in general, we're interested in sums that look like uh, some uh, constant term, uh, some z minus something or other term, uh, z minus something or other squared term, uh, z, z, c3z minus something or other cubed, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so that's expressed as a sum of coefficients, uh, cn z minus a to the n, and this is again, or this is around some constant value, around z equals a. So we think of a as the point, z equals a as the point where, where we're trying to approximate near, and when z is close to a, then z minus a is close to zero, its high powers are very close to zero, and so we'd expect this thing to, to um, converge very rapidly we'd expect, and we'd expect only, we only need a few terms to get a good approximation to the result. So typically, um, we say that's what we expect, so typically what happens is that there's going to be some kind of disk in the complex plane in which the thing converges. So in a picture, you'll have a complex z plane. Again, this is going to be x and y as usual, and uh, at each point, x plus i, y, write that point as z. Then, um, that's i, y. Um, then uh, in that, that picture of that plane, um, we'll have, uh, if we have some kind of series expansion, if we had some point A, again, A is going to have some some real imaginary parts. It's a complex number. Um, and then we look at z's near A, then there'll be some kind of uh, radius r disk um, in that plane in which we hope to, we, to get convergence. So. Um, so there will be uh, there'll be a number r called the radius of convergence, um, so that um, if uh, z is closer than r, then uh, our sum converges. So I've given us let's say we should say given uh, some uh, a power series. Uh, this kind of a series, so these are arbitrary constant terms, and then you have these powers. Um, there's uh, going to be a radius of curvature, so that inside the disk of that radius, in here, that's this inequality here, saying you're inside the disk, this sum uh, converges. And then uh, on the boundary of the disk, on that circle, which is the dashed points here, um, uh, we don't know what happens. Uh, uh, could be some points you could have convergence and some not, so question mark. And then um, outside, you definitely have divergence.
we won't prove this, but it's a useful idea to have in mind that there's always going to be this disk. Um, and on the boundary of the disk, we don't know what happens. Inside that disk, we get convergence, and outside, we'll get divergence. It's possible that that disk could be very small. In fact, uh, it's possible uh, to have our radius of convergence equal to zero, so that they don't you get divergence everywhere except perhaps at the point z equals a itself. So, um, so it's possible that that this that the series doesn't converge away from the point z equals a. A, a very special case of this picture is if we had a real series, um, a real power series. So that would be a sum Cn. Now we'll write it as x instead of z minus a. Here we assume a is real. We assume these Cn's are also real, real numbers. Um, and for a real power series, by the same token, you'll get uh, convergence instead of just in a, instead of in a disk in the complex plane. You get convergence in an in, in an interval, like an integral. Uh, so you get an interval of convergence, uh, which is going to be for uh, x minus a less than r. You get convergence uh, for x minus a bigger than r. You get divergence. And when x is uh, minus a is equal to r, then we don't know what happens. We don't have a general rule for what happens. So as, as a simple example, we know about the uh, geometric series and its sum. Um, so uh, we we know that if we have this sum n equals zero to infinity z to the n, that we also already spelled out as one plus z plus z squared plus z cubed plus dot dot dot. So it's a very important example. It's a it's a geometric series, and we know that its sum is one over one minus z, and um, in particular, at least that's if uh, z uh, is less than one in in, in uh, modulus, um, and then um, if uh, z's bigger than one in modulus, it diverges. And then when mod z equals one, we won't worry about what happens. Um, so uh, something strange could happen. Maybe if mod z is equal to one, we won't worry about it. But if it, if it's inside this radius of convergence, then you actually have an explicit expression for what the answer is. Um, outside, it has to be divergent, and on the boundary, we don't know. Um, so that gives us a, a simple example, and we know that this because we already worked out this formula for geometric series. So you could uh, generalize this um, uh, without much effort to things like 1 over z plus 2. Just try to see if you can find a way to change the variables to match up this one to this one um, as an example of a, of, of a finding explicit power series representation. Um, as another example, if we were to start the geometric series at a different spot, n equals 15 to infinity, so that's z to the 15 plus z to the 16 plus dot 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 dot, of course you could factor out a z to the 15th from every term. Um, they all have at least 15 powers of z, and then you can factor out those from every single term. So it's a product z to the 15 times the usual geometric series. So we start at z to the 15 instead of z to the 0, uh, we get 15 z's in everybody, which we can factor out, and so we just get z to the 15 times 1 over 1 minus z, um, if mod z is less than 1. And then you should be able to convince yourself that the um, that you you certainly couldn't come up with a with an answer um, outside of here. Otherwise, you could divide by z to the 15 and get an answer for the previous geometric series. And so this guy is going to be uh, diverging if mod z is bigger than 1. And then we don't know what happens on the boundary, where mod z is equal to 1. Let's uh, to consider more carefully what happens with real variables um, for the moment, just to make it a bit more comfortable. Uh, we'll look at the real variable situation. So we have a nice theorem about the real uh, power series. These power series are often called Taylor series or Maclaurin series or something like that, um, because those were students of Newton. Um, so, uh, so we have something like this. Of course, they were known to Newton before Taylor or Maclaurin. All right. So, if we have a power series like this, and let's give it a name. Let's call that function f of x.
um, f of x is the the function that for each x is the sum of this power series. Um, and suppose the radius of convergence is is some r is some value r. Um, so, and if we assume that that radius is actually positive, just so that we actually do have some convergence, otherwise it's not very interesting. Um, then the first uh, observation we want to make is that the derivative of the function is actually given by differentiating each term. Um, you just go through the series um, one by one, uh, step by step, and you just differentiate every single term. Uh, if I differentiated that as a function of variable x, it's a polynomial on x of power n, so I should get a power n pulling down cn x minus a to the n minus 1. And in fact, one thing we can note here is that you actually don't need to include the zero term. You can start at one, because if you put a zero in here, you just get zero. So zero, uh, n, n equals zero goes a zero term anyway. So it doesn't really need to be included. You can include that zero, or you can drop it and just start at one, because when n is zero, that dies off. Um, so this is a, a surprisingly strong statement. It might seem obvious since it's true for polynomials, but it's really not obvious because horribly complicated functions can be given by infinite series like this. It's not a polynomial function anymore because there are infinitely many terms, not finitely many. And so very, very complicated functions can be represented like this, and yet still you can differentiate as if it were a polynomial by differentiating each individual term in the sum one by one. And then another result is that you can integrate term by term and it's just the sum of the integrals. I won't uh, waste your time working out the integral. Um, C on, on n plus 1, x minus a to the n plus 1, um, plus a constant, because, of course, it's an indefinite integral. So you have to put a plus c in when you do an integral. But it means we can calculate an integrals term by term. And these are both uh, true. Um, uh, inside uh, when uh, you're inside the radius of convergence. So you can do formal manipulations term by term inside the radius of convergence. Moreover, this actually means that this guy is represented by this power series inside that radius of convergence. And so, in fact, this guy and this guy as functions of x have the same uh, radius of convergence as f does. So you can use the same letter r to represent the radius of convergence of the original guy, but it's also the same one for these as well. So you get um, radius of convergence unchanged when you differentiate and integrate, and you integrate and differentiate term by term. So this was quite spectacular. Newton discovered this and realized that he could now all of a sudden calculate out derivatives and integrals for all sorts of functions as long as he could express them as power series, which was pretty much any function he could come up with that would seem to be worth thinking about. You can find a power series for your exponential, your cosine, your sine, your logarithm, all those things, and then you can find all their derivatives and integrals just by explicitly doing this sort of thing. So, uh, so as long as you're comfortable manipulating these kind of series, infinite series, you can you can do calculus and and get very explicit expressions. And again, typically these sort of series tend to converge very rapidly for the functions we're usually interested in, and so that these will as well. And so you can um, calculate only a few terms and get a pretty good approximation, uh, which is pretty amazing. So Newton was able to immediately solve a huge range of practical problems in physics and, and, and in mechanical engineering by just being able to do this, these steps here. So let's just get comfortable with this sort of calculation. Um, we know um, from previous experience that the exponential function e to the x has a power series like this, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6 plus higher order terms. Now, again, that's going to be fairly accurate when x is close to 0, because it's expanded around 0. And it is actually a pretty accurate picture of the exponential near 0. And then we also know things like sine x, um, for example, is x minus x cubed over 3 um, over, what am I doing, x cubed over 6. Um, uh, plus higher order terms. So let's just do that simple approximation and let's try to do e to the sine x. Um, that's going to be by plugging sine x's in here 1 plus sine x plus 
This one gives me sine squared x over 2 plus higher order terms. If putting x's to be sine x's, you get this. And now we can plug in this approximation for the sine x, um, that uh, it's 1 plus the sine x is about x minus x cubed over 6 plus higher order terms. And then this guy gives me plus x uh, minus x cubed over 6 plus higher order terms squared and all divided by 2 plus higher order terms. Uh, so we're going to get a, a rough approximation of what the sine x actually looks like. Um, now at this point I'm only going to get this, the second order terms. The third order terms are some, they're going to be third order terms over here which I'm ignoring. So let's just work out a first and uh, zero order term is this guy, 1. Then there'll be a first order term from this guy. There won't be any from any of these because they're squared and higher terms. So there's only an x from here. And then if I look for a second order term, it's going to come from here. It's going to be this guy squared over 2. So plus x squared over 2. Plus, and then it'll be cubic and higher order terms. And that means, therefore, that the integral of e to the sine x, which I don't know how to do, um, this is 2, uh, e, this is e to the sine x, right? e to the power of sine x. It's too horrible to actually do as an integral. But I can definitely calculate out term by term just by integrate that. So this is e to the sine x. So integrate that 1 and get an x. Integrate that x and get an x squared over 2. Integrate that x squared over 2 and get x cubed over 6. And then higher order terms. So I don't know what the answer is, but something like that. That gives me a, a rapid fire uh, technique for, um, for computing out terms that expand out what I expect this thing to look like for small x. right? This is for uh, small x. Of course, the, the method doesn't tell you how small is small, so we don't really know how small x has to be to get this to be a good approximation. But if you plugged it into a, to a computer and took a look at, the, at the, the graph of this one and this one, you might get some sense of just how accurate you're getting. Just as, as we learned in thinking about complex numbers, where we had to be kind of fearless if we don't even understand what the, what the little letter i means, all we know is that i squared is minus 1, we fearlessly compute away as if we understood what we were doing, and we end up with explicit formulas that calculate out for us how to multiply complex numbers, how to divide complex numbers, and so on. The same sort of fearless attitude has to be applied here. Even if we don't have a theorem to back up what we're doing, we just try it. We try and expand things out and see if we can come up with some kind of formula. And then we check and see if that's actually really working in practice, um, often by computing simple examples and, and convincing ourselves that it's right. And we leave it to the mathematicians to worry about proving that these techniques work by and large. We could reverse the question and ask, how do we get the coefficients from these for these kinds of expansions? Where would we get them from? Um, if we already had some kind of description of our function, could we generate the coefficients in its expansions, in these Taylor expansions? And that's uh, also uh, an observation due to Newton. Um, and it's a very straightforward one. If we have a, a function um, that has a, a Taylor series and we don't know what the Taylor series is, how could we come about it? So suppose there was a function, and suppose we imagine that it has a Taylor series expansion, and we don't know what the Taylor series expansion is, where would it come from? So let's write that as a formal sum, n equals 0 to infinity of cn x minus a to the n. How do I generate these cn's if I don't know this expansion, if I only know the function by another name? I know it's the exponential function, the sine function. We just wrote those down as examples. We already said that they had these expansions. But where do the expansions come from? How do you get these coefficients c if you know the function really well, like an exponential or a sine or some of our other favorite functions, square roots, logarithms, all that sort of stuff? Where do these, these coefficients come from? The lowest order coefficient, the constant term, we call this the constant term, this is the linear uh, term and so on, it's a quadratic term and so on. So where's the constant term coming from? Well, if you just plug in x equal to a, then, uh, then you get uh, this expansion becomes f of a is equal to the c naught stays in plus, well, this becomes a zero because you plug in x is equal to a, you get x minus a is a minus a is 0. So that all dies off. And that one dies off too when x equals a, x minus a is 0, and so it squares 0, and so that disappears. And all the higher order terms disappear, just giving you c naught. Let's turn that around and then say, okay, so c naught is f of a.
So that gives us a formula to calculate the constant term. Now, um, what we're going to do is just differentiate this thing and try again. So we've, in other words, said if I don't know what the C's are, I don't know what these C's are, but I believe they're out there, I write down my, for my favorite function, say the exponential function or the sine function, where am I going to get the C's from? Well, C0 I'll get from calculating the value of the function at a particular point, x equals a. Uh, which is usually zero. Usually, in our, for most of our examples, a is going to be zero. Now, what happens if I differentiate the function? Let's see if I can keep the function up here. So here's my function. I'll differentiate it term by term, as we said we can. The derivative is, well, the derivative of a constant is always zero, plus the derivative of this guy in x is going to be c1, and then the derivative of this guy in x is going to be, this comes down, and it's 2c2 two x minus a plus the and now I'm going to plug in, just like I did in the previous uh, situation, I plugged in x equals a and saw what happens. And that gave me this formula. So I'm going to plug in x equals a again, plug in again x equals a and see what comes out. And we just get an explicit formula, f prime of a is, that's a zero, so it doesn't count for anything, that's a c1. It just stays where it was. Those terms all vanish because when x equals a, x minus a is 0, and that disappears. And the same for all the higher order terms. So you just get plus 0, plus 0, da, 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 all the way out forever. All these terms are turning out to be zeros. So we've got just this one term. And then we can turn that around and solve for c1 is f prime of a. So if I know how to calculate the value of the function at a point, and to calculate the value, it's derivative at a point, I can calculate c0 and c1. Um, and similarly, if I differentiate another time, I'll get f prime prime of x. This becomes 0. This was already 0. So 0 here. This guy's plus 0 here because that's a constant. So the derivative is 0. Then I get 2 times c2. And that becomes just 1 when you differentiate an x. Plus da 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 And that gives me then uh, plug in. Again, x equals a. Plug in. And we get um, f prime prime of a is 0 here, 0 here, so 0 plus 0 plus 2c2 plus, and then all these are zeros for the same reason. Again, all the terms there have the next minus a in them, so they all become 0. Now we solve this for c2, we get c2 is 1 half of f prime prime of a. It's not f prime prime of a, so it's not that simple. First uh, coefficient, c0, the, the, the constant term is just the, the value of the function. The, uh, linear term, the linear coefficient is the derivative. The quadratic coefficient is half the second derivative. And um, if we keep going, I won't do the calculation. It's actually done in the notes. You'll find that the third derivative at a, I'm, not, I'm skipping some steps, turns out to be uh, 3 times 2 times c3. Um, so c3 is 1 over 2 times 3 times f triple prime of a. So I'm not doing the steps there again. There's a few steps in here for you to do, just to, like the ones I did previously, and that gives you this third derivative term. So um, the general formula is if we let, we'll write n factorial to mean 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times dot 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 times n. Note that dot here means times. There is, of course, a great deal of... Uh, inconsistency in notation. Some people, when they write 3.2, mean uh, 3.2. I'd write that as 3.2 with the point at the bottom. Um, so that's the notation I'll use. So for me, a dot between two numbers means to multiply. It means 3 times 2. Um, and that's the notation I'll always use. As long as you make clear to me what your notation is, this for me means uh, uh, 32 over 10. Um, 3.2. Okay, but whatever notation you want to use, as long as it, you make it clear to me, that's fine. N factorial means the product of all the integers, all, all positive integers, up to N. Um, and we'll define 0 factorial to be 1, strangely enough, uh, not 0. Um, it's a useful notation. And then um, well, we can then say this 2 times 3, when they go into the next step, would give me C4 is 1 over, it'd be 2 times 3 times 4, times the fourth derivative at x equals a, and so on and so forth. So the general formula is going to be, um, you, we can write down the general formula as, um, as uh, c n is 
um, f uh, nth derivative at x equals a divided by n factorial. So that gives us a formula for how to calculate out all the coefficients in the series in terms of the um, derivatives of the function. So let's, let's do a simple example. Um, I want to know the square root of, let's say, square root of 101. And I don't have a calculator. I'm out in the woods, so for some reason I need to know the square root of 101. And I don't have a calculator. How would I do it by hand, or how does my calculator do it? Well, I know the square root of 100, which is not too far away. Um, so does that help? Um, let's try and make a function. f of x is square root of 100 plus some little bit x. Um, and let's see if I can figure out how I would approximate this guy using this guy. So, uh, so what we've got is a series expansion uh, based on derivatives. So that means I'm going to need derivatives. So it's convenient when you want to take derivatives that involve square roots to write them not as square roots but as powers, half powers. That's the first trick, that a square root should always be written as a half power when you want to do calculus. Um, it'd be best if we'd never invented the square root in the first place and always used powers, but we're stuck with the square root as a standard notation. So, uh, so we, we switch it into half powers and do calculus. When we differentiate once, we get a half of 100 plus x to the half power minus 1, which we can simplify as 100 plus x to the minus 1 half. Then we can do f prime prime of x, which is, well, you pull down the power one more time, so you get 1 half minus 1 half, because the minus half pulls down the front, and then you get 100 plus x, and you bring the minus a half down by 1. So we can simplify that. Uh, that becomes minus a quarter of a 100 plus x to the power of uh, minus, a, minus 3 halves. Okay, so we're getting... Um, Let's see if I can adjust that a little bit so it's a bit more visible. Okay, then, um, so we can calculate out derivatives. I don't want to do a lot of derivatives because they get rather complicated rather quickly. But let's just calculate them out around x equals 0 because I really want to calculate square root of 101. Um, that's a small x away from, from calculating out the square root of 100. But it's at 100 where I can calculate all these values. I can do these explicitly. So f of 0 is square root of 100 plus 0 is square root of 100. 10. So that one I know. f prime of 0 is this guy, uh, 1 half, 100 plus 0 to the minus a half. And if you remember how the half powers work, how powers work, um, that's 1 over square root of, and it's 100 because we get rid of the 0. So it's 100 to the minus a half, which is 1 over 100 to the half. It's 1 over square root 100. So that's 1 over 2 times 1 over 10 is 1 over 20. And then um, we've got f prime prime of 0 is, here it is, 1, oh, it's minus, sorry, it's, yeah, minus 1 quarter of what? Um, 100 plus x, and we plug in x is 0, to the minus 3 halves. That's minus 1 quarter. Let's see, I'm going to put that as 1 over 100 to the 3 halves is 1 plus a half. Um, 100 to the 1 plus a half. So that's uh, minus a quarter. Uh, 1 over, well, there's a 100. That's the 1, one of the hundreds. And then there's uh, plus a half more hundreds, which is um, a square root of 100. So a half, 100. So it's minus 1 over 4, 1 over 100. And then 100 to the half power is the square root of 100 is 10. So that, if I've got it all right, is minus 1 over 4 times 1,000, 4,000. Okay, so let's put it all together and try to figure out what's the square root of 101. Um, our expansion says that f of x should be, if it were given by a convergent series expansion, we don't really know that it is, but um, it's the, remember it was defined as the square root of 100 plus x. And according to our theory, if there were going to be an expansion, it would have to be this C0 plus uh, C1x plus C2x squared plus C3x cubed plus da 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 da, da. And um, 
and then those c's would be given by f of 0 plus f prime of 0 x plus f prime prime of 0 x squared plus, and I'll, I won't include the cube in the higher terms, I'll just drop it at that point. We know f of 0, we worked out, was 10. And then f prime of 0, we worked out, was uh, 1 over 20. And then f prime prime of 0, we worked out, was minus 1 over 4 thousand, and that's x squared. Oh, this I can put the x up here. Okay, so so maybe it's better to put it like that. So it's 10 plus x over 20 minus x to the fourth over 4,000 plus higher order terms. So now we're going to try and find a square root of 101. So now we've got this expansion, which we can write out again um, as, uh, so our expansion is f of x is 10, uh, what have I got, plus x over 20, is that right? I'll just check it, minus x, minus x squared over 4,000, plus higher order terms in x, and try x equals 1, and we get f of 1 is, well, it was defined to be the square root, so remember this was a square root of 100 plus x, so this is a square root of 101, uh, sorry, it's square root of 100 plus, you can't read that, um, it's the square root of 100 plus x. And we've expanded it out like this. So a square root of 101 should be this thing when x is 1, right? If it's square root of 100 plus x, plug x is 1 and you get square root of 101 is 1, 10 plus 1 over 20 minus 1 squared over 4,000 plus higher order terms. So that's 10 plus, let's see now, 1 over 10 is 0 0.1, so half of that is 0.1. 5, I think, right? Because 1 over 10 would be 0.1. And so then I take half of that and get 0.05. Now this is very, very, very small. Or plus, well, minus something small. It's a small positive quantity plus higher order terms. So what does that tell me? That the square root is about 10.05 minus something small and positive. Um, and then plus higher order terms, which I, I think are probably so much smaller that I, hard, I hardly will notice them. So that's what I think the square root of 101 is approximately. It's not maybe the most convincing case because you know you could st stick 101 into your calculator and take its square root, but it does give you some sense of where all this calculator stuff is coming from. It also gives you a sense of the history of this stuff. What was it like for, for engineers in the 19th century? They were doing this. This is what they were doing when they calculated square root of 101 before uh, their, the calculators came along. Now, if you, if you put it into your calculator, you should be able to find the square root of 101 is, according to my calculator, it's 10.04987.56.21. So we're getting awfully close. 10.05 is, is a pretty good approximate to 10.049. So you can see this stuff works, and it works to do real practical problems, simple, straightforward calculations that no one knew really how to do before Newton. Newton would have had absolutely no trouble doing this kind of thing. In fact, he would easily have expanded that much, at least in probably several more terms in his head. Um, and then he would have been able to not, don't, not just do this, but include this term. If you put that in there, you subtract 1 over 4,000, you should get an even more accurate approximation. According to my calculator, if I actually put this this in here, um, I get um, f of 1 is the square root of 101, the square root of 101 is, um, if, I, if I take the 10.05 and then put in this 1 over 4,000, I get approximately 10.04975. So I'm really getting very, very close answers. And this is by hand calculation, although I did actually do the last step with the calculator to figure out what's 1 over 4 thousand subtracted from this thing. But still, you get the idea that without using a calculator, by hand calculations, knowing how to do these kind of series expansions is a very practical technique to being able to calculate. Um, and and it, it's very much how we learned how to get calculators to do these sorts of problems. In the abstract theory of the thing, um, we can say that if we have a function, um, if we have some function f of x, which is uh, sufficiently smooth to get things going, so we can differentiate it, uh, so it has a derivative, and it has a derivative of its derivative, and so on and so forth, and they all exist, so that we can do this calculation. Then we can simply uh, try to define um, these series. We try and take uh, this c naught to be f of a, and 
c1 to be f prime of a, and so on and so forth. So in other words, we try and write f uh, by, and we try to approximate, and we ask if this is a, a, an accurate approximation, we approximate by a sum um, up to, let's say, some large number of terms, uh, the function's derivatives at the point x equals a divided by n factorial. That was what our formula was for our, our coefficients, these Taylor coefficients as they're called, um, times x minus a to the n. And then we wonder if that's going to be accurate. Um, we're worried about that as, as this is called the uh, nth uh, order uh, Taylor series. It only goes up to order n, and then if we do it all the way to infinity, it's called the Taylor series. Or it's also called, it was in our notes, it's called the nth order Taylor polynomial. And um, in our notes, we point out that the remainder term, the nth remainder term, is defined to be uh, the difference between the function and this series expansion that's supposed to approximate the function. And we said that in many cases it's a pretty good approximation. I even gave the square root example to convince you that it, you can practically do it and use it to, to actually calculate out. So if we take just the n first capital N terms in the series, uh, in this infinite series, and put them together and subtract that from the function, we get the so-called remainder. And the hope is that the remainder goes to zero. And that's what typically happens, so usual uh, functions that we'd encounter that if they're smooth enough, if there's no obvious reason why the function is nasty, why these some of these derivatives don't exist, usual functions that we'd arise, arise uh, that would arise in in our work will typically have um, will typically have the remainder term uh, going to zero in some uniform manner. And then of course then the, then um, uh, that's the same as saying that f of x is equal to its infinite series expansion. Uh, to the infinite uh, Taylor series. So, uh, so that, so then, and then we say the function is. We say uh, that if that happens, we say that f is f of x is an, an analytic function, an analytic function is one that's equal to its Taylor series expansion. And the weird phenomenon that arises in practical applications in chemistry, physics, biology, engineering is that typically either a function is going to be analytic or there's going to be an obvious reason why it's not. I mean, something really nasty is going to happen. Like if you see a function that has a sharp dip in it, some sort of sawtooth, okay, it's not analytic because it doesn't have a nice derivative. It's not smooth enough. But uh, otherwise, if there's no obvious reason why it's not analytic, then usually it is analytic, which is a bit surprising. It's not obvious why such uh, extremely sort of pure mathematical functions with these uh, sort of perfect behaviors occur so often in, in, in real-world applications, but they tend to. So typically, if there's no obvious reason why your function is not analytic, why your function is, if there's no obvious reason why it's nasty, then it's probably analytic, and it probably is perfectly fine to be approximated by, by an infinite series expansion like this. So as, as some examples, maybe to convince you that this is really not, not a crazy thing to do, um, it is surprising. It's surprising that, that everything seems to be either analytic or, or, or obviously horrible for some simple reason. It's not clear why that should happen, but, um, but it is true. So, uh, so as some examples of analytic functions, we know that uh, one, uh, sorry, 1 over 1 minus x um, is, uh, is the sum of the geometric series. Um, it's the sum of the xn's n equals zero to infinity. Um, and uh, so, in other words, 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus da 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 da. Uh, that's a, an, an analytic function because it's given by this series expansion. The analytic near, near x equals zero. Um, and uh, uh, the logarithm function, which we'll write as ln of x, which is uh, for us is log base e of x. Um, uh, sorry, not x. I don't want to do x. I want to do log of 1 plus x, because I want to expand around x equals um, uh, my x equals uh, 1. Um, I want to expand around 1, so I'm going to make a little bit of error away from 1. All right, so, um, so it's going to be the sum um, n equals uh, 1 to infinity. So I'm going to expand this function around x equals 0. So in other words, I'm exp it's, it's expanded so such a way that we're pushing a little bit away from, from um, uh, 
from 1 because log 1 makes perfect sense. And again, this is natural log of uh, base E, sorry, natural log base E 1 plus x is the function that I'm looking at. So natural log, uh, the log base E. Um, so it's going to be a sum uh, minus 1 to the n plus 1 x to the n over n. So if you write that out, that's x minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3. Note there's no factorials here, x to the fourth over 4, and so on and so forth. And uh, so this, this guy is convergent, I should say, maybe for minus 1 less than x less than 1. Um, this one here, this one is convergent for um, uh, for minus 1 less than x. It turns out to go to up to less than or equal to 1 here. Um, and so on and so forth. So there's lots and lots of examples. There are more examples in the notes. I don't want to do too many. Um, we did, um, okay, so we have arctan function. Um, it's a sum, uh, it looks like x minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the 5th over 5 minus x to the 7th over 7 and so on and so forth. Um, again, it's uh, in this case minus 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1. Um, and there are lots and lots of other examples. We already did the exponential, which turns out, maybe I should point out, uh, exponential is a very special one. It's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x. It's actually over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial plus da 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 da. So it's the sum x to the n over n factorial n equals 0 to infinity. And in fact, it converges amazingly enough for all real values of x, for any uh, real uh, x. In fact, it also converges for any complex x by the same series expansion. So this is uh, quite surprising because the previous ones, there was some constraint on the radius of convergence. But this thing has infinite radius of convergence, which is a case we didn't uh, discuss before. There are actually functions like this one there. there this thing is going to converge eventually, very, very slowly. When x is large, it'll converge, but eventually it converges, converges to uh, uh, for any, any x, no matter how large or small. For very small x, it converges very quickly, but uh, for very large x, it takes much longer to get a good approximation to the actual value of the exponential. And similarly, we know sine and cosine have these infinite series expansions. Probably better to look them up in the book and have me write them all out. So we, we could now think about the complex setting, about complex uh, uh, series. Um, so, for example, we had the exponential of a complex number is 1 plus z plus z squared over 2 plus dot 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 dot. Again, it's the sum of the z to the n over n factorial, n is 0 to infinity. So we can compute these things out. And um, what's surprising, perhaps, is that it also converges um, uh, for any uh, z in the complex plane, any complex number z. Um, uh, it has, in other words, infinite radius of convergence. Um, so and and that's also true of the exponential and the sine uh, by their in their um, series in complex variables. So that's a bit surprising. Um, it's it's useful to think about them sometimes in terms of these series. Uh, for example, the cosine has uh, an infinite series, which is uh, the sum minus one to the n uh, is z to the two n divided by two n factorial n is 0 to infinity. Uh, the sine has uh, an expansion, which is the sum n is 0 to infinity, also minus 1 to the n, but now using odd powers, You've probably seen these expansions for real uh, functions before, but now we're doing them for, with complex variables instead of real variables. So 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. So this has all the even powers of z over even factorials. This is all the odd powers over the odd factorials. So you could imagine if you put them together, you get both the even and the odd, and so you should get all of the powers, which would be the, what, what we saw in the exponential. The exponential has all the powers. Cosine has the even ones. Sine has the odd ones. Um, so it might be not too surprising that we could somehow get these things to uh, to add up to something like an exponential. Um, and you can easily see if you just plug in not z, but i times z to the uh, 
to the exponential function, you get cos z plus i sine z. You get it directly from these series expansions. If you just plug in uh, i instead of z instead of z here, you get i's in every one of these guys. When you have an even power, the i's uh, knock each other out in pairs and give you a minus 1, which gives you this, minus 1. Um, when z is odd, then you get i times um, evenly man, even number of z's, and so you get uh, this minus 1 here. So it's not hard to convince yourself by looking term by term in the expansions that you get this. So once you know that these expansions are accurate, the entire complex plane, then you can check identities like this by looking at them order by order in expansions. So expansions are very, very useful, not only because they give us rough approximations to functions, as long as we keep z close to zero, this should rapidly converge to something close to the sine of z, but also because they enable us to, to, to um, see algebraic relationships between, uh, between very complicated functions by just looking order by order at their, at their series expansions. In the next lecture, we'll look at vectors.